So welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. And today we are very happy to have Matthias Christendahl, an expert on quantum information and quantum communication. He's talking to us from the University of Copenhagen and he'll tell us about fault tolerant coding for quantum communication. Matthias. Well, thank you very much, Arthur, for the introduction and um, the invitation to speak. Um, I will uh, start screen sharing in, uh, in about a second, but as you see, I have a blackboard behind me. So if there are questions um, in between, just please um, uh, speak up. I might not be able to see you. So maybe unmute and, and, and say something, and then I will try to elaborate on the blackboard. It should be possible. Um, let's see, but I will uh, now start screen sharing a presentation. All right, can you see the presentation? Yes. Yep. Okay, Time. great. So I will turn on the laser pointer. So that's my laser pointer. And um, so let's get going. This is um, a joint work with Alexander Müller Hermes, who uh, used to be postdoc in uh, Copenhagen and is now in uh, Lyon. And uh, you can find um, down here the uh, archive number, and it will be presented next week at uh, the conference called QIP uh, 21, also online. Um, the title is Fault Tolerant Coding for Quantum Communication. Um, but before we get started with that topic, I want to tell you a bit about um, what part of, of the group here at QMath, and QMath is a center for uh, mathematics and quantum theory, um, what we've been doing uh, during the pandemic. Um, we have uh, namely tracking, uh, been tracking the coronavirus uh, from genomic data. <laughs> and you might ask why we have done that. And it's because um, uh, there is a connection um, and a lot in quantum information in, um, in condensed matter physics, um, theoretical condensed matter, people use uh, matrix product states or uh, tensor networks more generally and here the so-called projected entangled pair states in order to describe um, uh, quantum, um, quantum matter. And uh, this is a very successful method, both analytical and numerical and actually coming out from the uh, uh, mathematical physics community. But now, of course, you might put such a tensor network on a tree and um, then um, you can study with it. And actually, these are the underlying models of phylogeny and ancestry, studying ancestry. So when um, uh, the pandemic started and there was a lot of virus uh, genome available, um, uh, we were all on Zoom and here you see the team. Um, we started um, uh, looking into this ancestry uh, relations and actually we published a um, a, a paper on the uh, um, uh, on the Danish genome that's available of the coronavirus, and nowadays, of course, it's in um, because there are different variants um, uh, that people talk a lot in, in the media. So, very briefly, um, what we did was we looked at the um, sequences of the coronavirus. It's a, the coronavirus has a thirty thousand base pair long uh, string, essentially, and um, uh, RNA and uh, the first thing you have to do you have to align the sequences so that you then can pick out where are the differences and where are the mutations um, and then what you want to do is you want to build such a tree and here you see a tree from the beginning of the epidemic um, in Europe it came in from um, from northern Italy or via Austria um, uh, to, to Denmark and here down here you see the um, the root of the tree is, is put at the Wuhan sequence and uh, so the idea of building such a tree is that similar sequences are closely related. Um, so they have a smaller hemming distance. So the tree building process starts by uh, building a hemming matrix or a hemming a distance matrix, and then um, uh, to start to cluster them together in order to build such a tree. And there's software available for doing that. Um, so we, we, um, we did that. Um, but of course, this talk is not gonna be about um, coronavirus sequences. Um, this was more a practical data analysis, you might say. Um, so let's go back to the topic of uh, the talk, uh, which is um, fault tolerant coding for quantum communication. Before you go back, Matthias, maybe tell us what you concluded. Um, well, I mean, for, for me, the, the, the one basic insight was that well, what, what we saw at least was that it's, it's one can track the uh, infection chains uh, very well with the genomic data. So even though the virus genome uh, mutation rate is not so high, uh, you can track it very well. And then of course we could 
uh, in the genomic data uh, by comparing the Danish to the ones abroad, we could see very clearly where um, uh, and confirm messages from the media where it came in and also like how it transmitted inside Denmark, that it transmitted inside Denmark. So we, we could identify infection chains of length up to six in within a six week period and then also where it, moved, uh, where it left to. Um, so I think this was yeah, very informative. Um, especially because Denmark was at the time under lockdown. So it's a bit like a laboratory system and there was a lot of data available. So, uh, so that was very interesting. Did you see this British variant coming into Denmark? Um, there is data available now, but at the time, so our study was from the first six weeks. So until mid-May, so the British variant only appeared in September. Um, but yes, I mean, in principle, um, you can study that and data is available. Um, but yes, so I want to tell you now um, about um, quantum communication and um, uh, and so just let's get started. Communication is part of information theory and um, so what is information theory? In a nutshell, um, the idea of Claude Shannon in the 1940s was to abstract the concept of information um, from its physical implementation. And so here you see a string of bits and you could represent it on a punch hole card, on a, a magnetic drive, on, you know, on your phone and in some kind of data storage. But somehow we have the idea of this abstract concept of information independent of where it's represented. And so the claim at the time was that all information can be abstracted this way and that leads to, to information theory. And um, uh, in the realm of communication, um, the, the impact of this is um, to do with coding theory. So imagine you have, have an input um, that you want to communicate to another party and you, you might now think of um, an independent sample import or um, just a, a bunch of bits you want to send the other party. Then what you use is you use an encoder to encode the information and then you want to transmit it via a channel. And you could think of the channel as being a, um, a cable from, from A to B and that you are using sequentially many times, or you can think of it as many cables that you're using once simultaneously. It doesn't make such a big difference here. And then at the other side, you put a decoder and you receive the output. And if you manage to do it really well, then the output and the input, of course, should be the same. And you should have somehow made very efficient use of your channel, even though the communication channel is very noisy. And actually, the communication channels are very noisy. So if you um, think of um, um, our communication now or the communication of your computer to the router uh, is actually a very noisy communication channel. So uh, one can define now formally what it means, uh, a capacity or it means how many bits we can transmit per channel use. Um, and so we start by saying, let's start with M input bits and we have N channels we want to use. And then what we want to study is the so-called capacity of the channel. And there's a long formula here. Um, what is important now is that uh, the first of all, what's important, we want to study the ratio. So how many bits M can we transmit per channel use? Then we want to do this in a large n limit. And, um, uh, but then we are actually, uh, we want to, we want to, um, we have, we're fine with the small error. Okay, we're fine that if, if the probability of input and output are not exactly equal, but, with, but they only have to be uh, different with probability epsilon uh, sample over our, over our input. So we're allowing this, and this was the key insight of Shannon that allowing an error epsilon here would really like make it efficient, even though this error could be arbitrarily small. So you can think of the error as being 10 to the minus 10 or something, and then, um, uh, and then studying this, this capacity. And uh, actually he was able to derive a formula and here's the formula, it's the so-called mutual information um, of um, the, the input variable with the, with the output variable maximized over all input variables. Um, and at this many bits per channel one can transmit. And um, uh, this mutual information is actually given as a difference of uh, Shannon entropies. Um, and so that's just a formula. We don't want to now look very much in detail into the formula, but it's a nice computable uh, formula for us here for the capacity. Now let's go to quantum information because 
um, somehow this claim of, of, of Shannon and Turing that all information can be abstracted just only really applies to classical information. And so in quantum information, um, the idea is just the same, but now we want to abstract the concept of quantum information from its carrier, so from its physical implementation, from its quantum implementation. And the abstraction is, of course, um, that we have uh, instead of zero and ones, we have uh, cat zero and cat one, and then uh, instead of strings of bits, we tensor them together. And regardless of which system we have, we can also have superpositions, of course, because it's quantum mechanics, but it doesn't matter. They can represent, um, um, they can represent a, a, an atomic system or they can represent a superconducting qubit system, uh, the states there, or a, an optical system. Um, so again, it's the same idea that the concept of information is abstracted from the physical carrier. It's just now a more general theory of information. And so the claim really is that all quantum information can be abstracted this way. This is the foundation of the field of quantum information theory. And, and now, of course, we can again look at the communication paradigm and, 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 and define that and, and, and try to understand what is happening there. And um, so we have an input. Um, we'll, we can encode it again. And now we can use the channel. And the channel now we have to think of a more quantum mechanical object. It could be a glass fiber over which we can transmit single photons so that actually the input to the channel is a quantum mechanical system and the output as well. And so the encoder will transform the input, and you can think of the input as being classical for the moment, into a quantum state that is then a, being transmitted across the channel. And at the end of the channel, there is a decoder again. And um, this is again some kind of quantum measurement, if you want to think about it that way. And it outputs you a classical string again. So in this setup, um, we again want to now look at m input bits. I want to use n channel users, just as before. Um, but now, as I mentioned, the channels will be quantum mechanical, and here will be a quantum mechanical measurement or a circuit um, that results in a classical output. Um, and of course, the encoder will also be quantum. And, um, but we could also consider quantum information as input and output. Um, but for this talk, we will leave this as classical information that would suffice to, to study the setup. And um, to, I want to, to, to understand the main ideas I want to transmit to you today. So we'll leave the input bits classical. We'll leave the output bits also classical. And um, so it's the classical, it's a so-called classical capacity of a quantum channel that we want to study. And here is the formula. It's just the same formula as before. It's just the interpretation changes a little bit. Um, and the formula, actually, the, the, the formula for the solution is also actually similar in a sense. It's not exactly the same because one needs a so-called regularization. There is a complication appearing to do with the additivity of the Holebo information. Um, um, but, but the formula here is the same. And let me just um, also here, like this formula, instead of the Shannon entropy, we now have the phenomenon entropy. But again, the formula itself will not be so relevant um, for the talk. Um, yes, OK, so what did change? Um, so if we're going back and forth, um, uh, it's the same. We want to study the number of input bits per channel use. We want to have that the probability of the input and the output um, that probability that the input does not equal the output, we want to keep that low, below an epsilon. We fix the epsilon. We then drive the number of channels arbitrarily large to infinity, but then we can make the epsilon arbitrarily small. Okay. So if you want to, uh, it's very important that the order of limits is correct here, but if you want to think of it, think of epsilon being very small, like 10 to the minus 10 or something like that and then you take n very large, then you have a very good approximation to the capacity. Right, the important difference now here is that the supremum, instead of going via classical maps that do the encoding, um, is actually a, a quantum circuit that does the encoding and also the decoding is a quantum circuit followed by measurement, or you can think of it as like a big quantum measurement. But maybe you can think of it as a decoder and then we have a measurement at the end. Okay, so the interpretation changed a little bit. It just looks the same. Uh, I tried to put lots of these pictures uh, uh, in there, and maybe it's a good time to ask you now if something is unclear regarding these, um, uh, these pictures that I'm, I'm drawing. Uh, can you tell me what classical means in a quantum context? 
um, a classical in a quantum context would now mean um, that, for instance, uh, so that that this bit that you're only allowed to use the states cat zero or cat one, Thank and you. not position. Do you want to say something about entanglement assistant? Um, no, I would like to uh, refer this to later. We can uh, study other types, also quantum capacity. We could we could look at, um, um, but we will. I will don't want to do it now, and um, maybe it will become clear during the or at the end. Maybe I can come back to that question. Um, why this is the simplest setup? Um, for, for, fair enough. For fair enough. No, it's okay. Not now. It's okay. <laughs> Okay, are there more questions? Um, I, have, I have a small one. In the slide on classical um, systems, X and Y represented, like X could be your strings of inputs, like zeros and ones on inputs, the probability distribution on what kind of zeros, the sequences you expect, and likewise for Y for the outputs. But you briefly mentioned that here using the von Neumann entropy, even though you have classical inputs and outputs. So I was confused about that statement. Um, uh, yes. Oh. Um... Yes, the reason is that the formula here has to be evaluated um, is, the, uh, is the mutual information between the, uh, a distribution on the inputs and the outputs of the channel. But the output of the channel is a quantum system. Um, before you decode or after you decode? Uh, yes. so, so it, this is just, no, this is just for the, um, it's just for the formula. Okay, so there's a formula, this is called the HSW theorem. Um, that uh, it's a little bit, I, I wrote it down in a little bit in an informal way, but uh, this is like the, uh, the equality sign here is the so-called Tolevo-Schumacher-Westmolen theorem. Um, uh, and, and what the quantity that's evaluated here is, is the mutual information between the input quant, so like a distribution over a single letter of the input and, and the output of the channel, but the output of the channel is a quantum system. And that is why you have to um, have the mutual information, but it is true. So if you look into the formula I wrote down here, actually H of X is still like um, uh, Shannon entropy. And H of Y would now be the output of the channel, which would be a quantum system. And this would be a joint classical quantum. Entropy. I see, thank you. Last the question. question, how do you regularize uh, how you regularize. Um, uh, yes, so you define um, uh, the quantity and then you, um, so the quantity here, uh, actually I forgot to write it, has a maximization over this distribution over the inputs. Okay, and now um, this is on one letter, so X and um, for one channel. So maybe I can um, try to write this on the board. You should be able to see the board. Um, so the uh, what we consider is this right massive. larger, right larger. Okay, is that better? Okay, it's the maximum over distributions p x on the input symbol, and then. Uh, we uh, we have the channel, and so the channel. Um, let's denote the channel by um, um, by by lambda. And what you can put so you you have the input symbol p x, and for that input symbol you can produce the state rho x, and then you um, you put that into your channel, and you get an output state. Rho x tilde, say, and then you have a joint distribution. You can define a joint quantum state of the x system, and now what I call the y system, the output system, as the uh, distribution over x. And then um, you 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 put uh, um, you put an x here, and then you tensor with the output of the channel. Okay, and this is now. Um, and now you compute the mutual information of this row. So we are interested in now the quantum mutual information of this row, the state, um, I, let me call it row tilde here. 
and uh, that's some quantity and um, and if we call this here the um, I one um, then what you instead of instead of applying this on one channel row lambda you can now apply this on uh, the same formula for lambda tensor tensor um, tensor k okay so if you take the same formula and I put here now a uh, instead of one I take tensor k I can um, um, I can define a lambda k okay so instead of the, basically instead of applying the formula on lambda I apply it now on on k copies of lambda so on the on k copies of the channel um, and then uh, you uh, you take the same formula from before and you have to um, regularize this because the quantity itself is not additive on the tensor product so you have to um, uh, you have to take it and then you divide it by k and um, and then you take the limit of k goes to infinity so essentially you just you evaluate the formula the formula is given as a formula in terms of one use of the channel one use lambda but if you if now you uh, the formula for the capacity um, actually um, uh, is is has to be evaluated on the k full tensor product and then you have to take the limit k goes goes to infinity okay and it's because this quantity is not multiplic or not additive so lambda of one channel of lambda tens uh, the quantity on lambda tensor lambda is not the same as two times the quantity on lambda and uh, this is in contrast to the situation in um, uh, in classical information theory klaus does that answer your question partially yes okay i think it's very difficult matthias to see the blackboard when you write on it so it's better if you just answer the questions directly Okay, maybe it's better if I just answer it. Okay, or I write less. Okay, sorry. Okay, are there any more questions at that point? Okay, good. Um, then let's let's go on. Uh, but the regularization is not so important now for us. More, what's more important is the is the is is the definition actually. Um, because what you see here in the uh, scenario is that the the noise that we consider is all in is the channel. So the entire noise and the entire setup only occurs in the channel. The encoder and decoder are basically assumed to be perfect in the scenario. Okay, both classically and quantum mechanically, and um, uh, so that is but just the scenario people study. Um, so um, let's take that scenario. And what we observed is actually that this assumption of noiseless encoder and decoder is unrealistic. So the channel is noisy, that's noisy classically as well. And it's, um, it's very reasonable, um, you know, it's a very reasonable model to model the noise of this channel. Um, and classically, actually, the encoder and decoder are, are very are noiseless. I mean, your phone does not make any mistakes, really. So it, it's it, the transformation of the encoder of the input into what has to be transmitted over the channel is is near perfect. So the assumption classically is, is is fine, but in the quantum world, this assumption is actually not satisfied. And we, on top of it, we don't believe it will be satisfied very soon. So when we have when we build an encoder and a decoder in a quantum computer, like in the Google machine or in uh, you know anything we imagine in the near future or even medium or long term future. Um, people would subscribe to the statement that, uh, you know, they will always be noisy. Okay, so, um, and, and what does noise mean? Noise mean that this encoder, it's, it's a circuit, it consists of many components, and noise means that these components um, uh, will, with some probability, be hit by an error. Like I hit them here. <laughs> um, and actually, entirely new problems appear. Um, one question one may ask is, is quantum communication at all possible in this scenario? Is this capacity in this, in this setting where they are being hit by noise, maybe it's just zero. Um, and maybe if the answer is positive, that it's positive at all, possible at all, one could ask, is this formula continuous? So if the noise here 
it's very small. So if 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 we if we if the noise is uh, uh, I call it the gate error, is this a noise? Uh, if this is uh, only with probability delta they are being hit, and if I'm if I decrease it to zero, it's actually the capacity continues. And do I recover the noiseless formula I had before? Um, these are the questions uh, we asked ourselves, and um, and uh, and it brings us to this 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 field called fault tolerant quantum computing that has existed since the 90s and it's actually a highly developed field and where people have developed tools to combat noise in computation. And so you might say, well, Matthias, you know, it has been solved already. I mean, in quantum communication, you know, in quantum computing, people have developed these tools and they've been better and better. And, you know, uh, here is the scenario, you know, people have uh, studied that they have, they have an input, they have a computation, they build some encoding of the computation, we'll talk more about it, and then would they get an output and actually, um, uh, and, and actually it, it, it simulates perfectly the others, so noise can be suppressed. So, um, we are in, in, in the situation, though, that, um, uh, so, so why not use that here already, right, I have twice as encoded uh, uh, I, I could replace my encoder by an encoded encoder and the decoder by an encoded decoder, and I just use the tools or I just use the theorems from there. And so, and 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 actually, it's not directly usable. And and what is the reason? It's because in this in this scenario where people study fault tolerant quantum computing, the input and the output here are assumed to be classical, or they are classical. So the tools are developed for this. But note that the situation here is different. The input, we assume, is still classical, but the output of the encoder, so the input to the channel, the output of the encoder is actually quantum mechanical. And likewise, the input to the decoder is also quantum mechanical. So the tool for just using this twice here actually doesn't apply. And um, and so, um, uh, so, so, so the answer is no, it's not ready use. So we have to do something. We have to do some work here to understand and answer the questions that I posed before. So that's the plan. Um, the plan is we want to talk about error correction, quantum error correction. Then we want to look at the tools. We have to now do these two things, right? We have to combine communication theory with fault tolerant techniques. And so we first look at the fault tolerant quantum computing. We have to look at the setup and we have to look at the key result in that area. That's the threshold theorem. So the threshold theorem says there is a threshold for the level of noise below which it can be arbitrarily suppressed. And then uh, we have to define, we have to define what it means to study fault tolerant quantum communication. So we'll have a definition and we'll have the main result, which is a threshold theorem analogously um, for that setup. And then we'll, I'll tell you about the proof. It's reducing it to an effective channel and then we'll study. So reducing it basically back. So we want to use two steps. The first is we want to use our noisy communication paradigm. We want to morph it back to the noiseless communication paradigm. And then actually we'll have some complicated channels appearing there that we have to study. And then we'll look at the capacity of that. Okay, so that's the plan. Okay. Any questions to the plan? Then let's continue. Error correction. Um, here is the simplest error correction um, code. You want to protect um, a bit that's in a zero state. You want to protect it against um, noise. What do you do? You encode it in the repetition code. So you just, whenever you see zero, you repeat it as zero, zero, zero. Now imagine it's being hit by an error, but just one error somewhere. So maybe say in the middle, the middle bit is flipped to one. Then there's a simple decoding algorithm called the, the majority decoder. It, you just count, are there more zeros or ones? And there are more zeros, you, you go decode to zero. Now there are two zeros. Um, and if you, you encode a one into one, 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 if you get one error, right? This one error from above, then it goes to one, zero, one. And if you decode, you would get the one, right? By just doing majority vote. It's a very simple decoder and it, it, it protects you a bit against one error. Right? You encode one so-called logical bit into three physical bits and then the code is robust against one error appearing at any place. Okay? Only if two errors would appear you would decode wrongly. Okay. 
Now in quantum error correction, um, uh, uh, there is a quantum version of this repetition code. It's called the Shor code. I took the um, pictures from Wikipedia. Here, in the zero is encoded not into three, but into nine qubits. But you see, on every three qubits, it looks very much like a repetition code. The zero goes to, um, you know, like these three blocks here. It's re repeated three things of the same type. And here it's again an orthogonal thing of the same type. And then that protects you against one type of error, bit flip error, and then you have the face flip error. And that is also protected. So because in quantum mechanics, you can have two types of errors. You can either have a bit flip, just as we have above, or you can have the face flip of your qubit. And so therefore, instead of three qubits for the repetition code, you need to have, have it uh, twice in some sense, and then you get nine qubits. All right, so now how do you do this in practice? If you have the input, um, here you have your, your qubit, you want to encode it in this code, and you see you need these nine, you, um, yeah, you have these uh, eight, eight qubits additional, you put them in a state zero, and then you run some complicated circuit. This is a so-called C not gate, so it controls and inverts that one, controls on that one, and the one here, then you do Hadamars, you do these other ones, and you can verify very easily that if you put here a zero in, what happens is you get this state here, and if you put a one in, you get the other logical state. Then if one error occurs, um, yeah, so, sorry, then if one error occurs, you can do the decoding and it will be um, uh, successful again. Now, but what if the encoding and decoding, um, uh, decoding operations have errors themselves? So this is very good in, in protecting an error that happens within storage, right? After you put it in here, then you make an error and then you can, you can correct the error. But what if like your quantum circuit itself while doing the error correction or the encoding makes errors, right? Can you protect against that? And um, here you could uh, imagine that um, uh, instead of the error happening sort of in the storage phase, you could have an error happening up here. And what might happen there is that actually the error could spread because of these controlled knots. The errors could spread and suddenly you have three er three errors here, but the code cannot protect against three errors. And that actually means that the error correction can fail. So what can happen is that you have a perfectly nice error correcting code. It protects against one error. But now if you if the if this error doesn't happen in storage, but it happens while you're doing the code, it could actually fail to correct that error. And this is the topic of, of fault tolerance. Fault tolerance is the art of designing codes and coding and decoding procedures such that you correct more errors than you introduce while running the procedure. And um, I have to, mm, yeah, let me see if I can have to move. I cannot see all what is on the slide. I have to move it. So uh, this is one thing that I want to want to tell you is that the art of fault tolerance is to make sure that the codes are designed so that the error correction procedures can have errors themselves and nevertheless coding and decoding work well. And this is quite a uh, involved subject that takes care of this. But there's one other thing I want to tell you on the slide that is that regardless of how you code your qubit, regardless of what you do in encoding and decoding, it's a little bit of a trivial observation, but it's important. Imagine you encode and then you decode. You can never protect an unprotected qubit. If an error happens at the very last step here, right before, it will corrupt this qubit. So regardless of what you build as protection mechanisms for your qubits and encoding them in circuits and decoding them in this and that, if you ever go back to like a qubit at the very end and it's unprotected, just in the step before you decoded it to the unprotected qubit, it might be hit by an error and it might be unprotected. 
So these are the two messages. One is the field of fault tolerance, and the other one, you can never protect the unprotected qubit. It's, it's maybe trivial, but when you, it's, it's sort of like um, interesting observation. Now, um, fault tolerance quantum computing. So what do people do? So they have an input to their computation, right? So now you want to just do a computation. You have a classical input, you want to compute some function. What you do is you encode. And because the assumption is that it's classical, the input here, and we assume that in contrast to quantum information, the classical information is stable. And this is an assumption, um, basically validated by experience now, it's, it's very, very stable. Then you can encode that, then you can build this encoded circuit. I'll tell you more of how to build it. And then you decode it again into the stable information at the output. So in quantum computation, when we think about say Shor's algorithm, you have this large number that comes in as the input. You take that large number, you encode it in some code, then you run Shor's algorithm, but you run it in some kind of error correcting code, I'll tell you more how to do that, and then once you have the answer, namely like the encoded uh, prime factors you multiply, then you decode those and you obtain the output. Okay. This is, but the output again is classical. It's just these numbers. So you should think of quantum computing as something that takes a classical input and a classical output for this talk. And then we can talk about what it means if there is quantum input. So yes, again, the classical information is assumed to be stable or already presented in an error correcting code. And thus, if we are being hit, I just said before, here by an error, it does not matter because the assumption is the errors here don't matter. They will only hit you in the error correcting, in the say encoding procedure, or they hit you in here or in the decoding procedure. And then the art is to make a special construction so that the errors do not spread. The error correction corrects more errors than it introduces. Um, I have to move you around here. Now you might say, oh, what kind of model of errors do you have? And uh, we, for, for the remainder, we take a very simple model. We call it IID Pauli errors. One can make more complicated models, but again, that's a question for later. We take this Delta. Um, the model is that either your, your state is, your qubit is not affected with probability one minus Delta. Sorry, I just wanted to switch the laser pointer on. Uh, it's not affected or it's really the delta, delta divided by three, you get a Pauli X rotation or you get a Pauli Y rotation or you get a Pauli Z rotation, okay? Another way of writing it is that with some probability one minus, I think also roughly delta, um, nothing happens to the qubit or with, with the remaining probability, it's, it's wiped out and replaced by identity. It's also called it's completely depolarizing noise, okay. But you can think of every time the strikes here as one of the Pauli errors striking, okay? So either an X or Y or Z strikes. And we assume them to be independent in the locations of the circuit. Um, I, I know this is a model and it's important to study models, but um, if I wanted to realize this, would it be more realistic to assume like a slightly different error, like maybe like a distribution over all possible spins in arbitrary directions? Um, um, yes, so there are different error models. I think another one that's relevant, highly relevant is so-called amplitude damping noise that is actually sort of like structurally different because everything sort of like gets, uh, uh, goes down to zero. And, and yes, it's, it's, it's important to study other error models. And um, um, I think for us, it was now a proof of principle to study this. We can also study different probabilities here and generalize it. But um, um, this topic in general is, um, there's another thing that is, is about correlations among the errors. Now we assume IID errors. You might also like put, make them correlated. Um, uh, but this sort of like, a, um, uh, yeah, so one can generalize the error models, absolutely. Um, and depending on what is relevant. So I think for us, it was now important to have a error model where we could write down a proof sort of like in concise way um, because already, these papers get quite long and the, the subject has generalized it. And I think certain generalizations are possible, certain gen generalizations are not possible. For instance, you cannot protect, you know, or 
at least not with these type of techniques against say a stray magnetic field hitting all qubits with the same rotation. Okay, so, um, uh, so there is sort of like an intermediate regime where you can generalize it to. Thank you. All right, but how are these circuits constructed? And um, the way it works is basically, uh, it's, the, it's called a gadget. So you pick a universal gate set and uh, we're already seen sort of like a sigma x, y, z. There's also the T gate and then there's a controlled not gate we've already seen before. It doesn't matter now for the moment what exactly those are. Um, there's also the preparation of a zero and the preparation of a one and the partial trace. I also want to add them to my gate set so that I can produce qubits and I can destroy them in a sense. So I pick such a universal gate set. For us, it won't matter now what exactly that is, but let's take it. And then you, you write the circuit into this universal gate set. And, um, and here it is. And then how does the encoding work? Every gate will be replaced by a gadget. What is a gadget? It's basically a, a, you replace every wire by say seven wires in some code, or if you think of the shore code by like the nine qubit shore code. And then every, every gate will be replaced. So this is why I have seven here. Every gate will be replaced by um, uh, by these many more wires. So if we do this once here, we we go from 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 um, uh, from the number of uh, the number of uh, qubits as an input. We they are multiplied by factor seven, right? And then you have the you have it encoded once in the short code. And um, now these gadgets here, I will also give them an end error correction at the start of it, so they will always attempt to. Um, uh, to, to correct the error and then run the gate and so on. Okay, so um, uh, this is sort of, um, but just like the structurally, you replace it gate by gate by some uh, so-called gadgets that then have nice properties. And you see, because they're encoded, they somehow are, the qubit in there should be more protected if they're cleverly constructed. Um, and then um, if we want to do the encoding uh, operation, right? So for instance, in the seven qubit Steen code, um, uh, we go from uh, one wire to seven wires. And, and here, actually, I, I put them down for you. That's the seven qubit Steen code. It's, not, it's a bit like the shore code uh, from before, but it's a little better because it behaves a little better. And also, it has only seven qubits instead of nine. Um, but, uh, and then you can think about what the logical one is. But let's not do that now. Um, and then uh, there is a, a very famous paper by Lefebvre, Gottesmann, and Preskill, where they proved the rigorous threshold theorem. And um, uh, we, we took the gadgets from there. And um, the gates will be replaced by these gates. And actually, there's a, sometimes there are types of gates called transversal gates. Um, and that means actually that the gate is very clever. You only need to execute. So uh, you only need to execute the same thing on all of the qubits. Okay? It doesn't work for all gates, but uh, for some of them. And um, for instance, a bit flip of the logical bit, you can um, uh, do by many uh, bit flips here on the um, um, uh, many independent bit flips. But then we want to protect more than just doing it once. You can now concatenate this, okay? So you take one and you blow it up and you have the seven qubit thing, and then you, you do it. You do it K times. I think it's the K times, yes. And actually the encoding gets, so the suppression of the error is actually doubly exponentially good in this level K. So this is really great. Uh, so it gets very fast, very better, but um, it also becomes very complicated with this encoded encoding and so on. And there's of course large effort to have better codes and there are other families of codes, but for I wanted to be concrete for this project. And that's why we took the one from the Alifera Scottsman Preskill, seven qubit concatenated steam code. And how is the decoding? Well, that's error correction and decoding. So we decode and we concatenate, right? So we try to error correct and decode. And this way we go back to the single qubit. But as I said, that is, cannot be so great. And, um, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, uh, there, must be a, the, there must be some total amount of error on this. And that is, one can actually show that even though you do many procedures, the dominant noise effect is the last gate that happens at the very end. What I told you, this intuition that, oh, you cannot protect the unprotected qubit. And actually, if you like decode it from some large code, because the code was so good in the beginning, uh, uh, you have this exponential series that sums up of, of errors and, and there will just be a constant times the original error. 
So this is maybe something to remember and we'll, we'll come back to that. So let me formulate the threshold theorem by Alfeos, Gottesmann, Preskill. Um, so basically they design a procedure for, um, uh, for uh, taking a quantum circuit and encoding it. Um, so taking a quantum circuit and encoding it into a, uh, a code with the gadgets that I presented to you before, such that the output distribution or the output will be the same with high probability of the two. And formally, what does that mean? Formally, it means there is a threshold delta zero, um, strictly greater than zero. You can think of it as like a small number, like 10 to the minus four or 10 to the minus eight, something like that. It shows some very small number, but it has been increased over the years, such that for all errors that are smaller than that, and all circuits and inputs, and here is a circuit, and these are its inputs, such that the probability of the output of the K level encoded circuit right with the k level concatenated code at delta noise the probability that that out that this output is not the same as the output from the unencoded one at zero noise that somehow has to depend on the size of the circuit so it's order of the number of gates in the circuit because there's some kind of union bound involved and then it's this doubly exponential suppression of error that I mentioned. So it's delta. So if you think of this delta here is smaller than, you know, like a half times a delta zero, right? So if this is 10 to the minus four, this is a half times 10 to the minus four, then, then here it says two to the two to the K, right? Or uh, a half to the two to the K, right? So it's a very small number. So you can take K to be very small you can take k to be, you know, um, uh, log in the number of uh, in the number of gates, logarithmic in the number of gates, or even smaller, and then still this combined error will go very fast down. So it's it's negligible. Okay, and this is formally what that statement says. So if you have a if you have some uh, if you have a circuit, then actually the uh, the number of levels you need to encode doesn't have to be very many. And then, uh, and then um, so the total number of gates of your encoded circuit here will actually be not be much bigger than the original one. And, um, and, and, and you, you, can, you can compute, okay? So if you have Shor's algorithm and it runs in polynomial time on a noiseless quantum computer, then this threshold theorem tells you that if you have a noisy quantum computer running below the noise threshold, you will still have a polynomial time algorithm for running Shor's algorithm. It's a very fundamental theorem because it tells us that we can run Shor's algorithm on a noisy machine. Okay. Are there any questions for that? I'm not doing. Okay. Maybe I'm doing not so great for time, but let's see. So, what I want to now tell you, I want to move on to telling you about the fault tolerant capacity because we have the setup now that um, um, that we that that we have the noiseless setup and we have our capacity that you have seen before i want to introduce now the um, and i want to emphasize this is over noiseless encoder and decoder pairs with m inputs so it's just a setup we've studied before now what we're going to do is we're going to design some circuit like that and we want to study the capacity at delta noise that's just the same it's the capacity, but now it goes over all, the supreme goes over all choices of fault tolerant codes and all encoder decoder pairs with N, M input. So it's the same, but I'm also allowed to choose an encoding. And then I'm allowed to, I'm looking at this capacity of the delta. Okay. So what is important here is that the amount of noise is not allowed to decrease with growing N. So I'm fixing the noise at delta, then I'm taking the limit n to infinity, just as I do in a capacity. And I'm studying it at this constant noise. Okay. The problem is actually simpler if you're allowed to decrease the noise. Okay. So it's important for me to stress that. Okay. So we define this capacity at, at, at delta noise. And then we have a threshold theorem that says that the capacity and the original capacity are actually very close to each other. So there is a threshold, 
such that for all values smaller than the threshold, the capacity of the one with delta noise, surely it's smaller than the one with the noiseless, but it's not much smaller. It's actually lower bounded by the one for the noiseless case, minus a small function that actually goes to zero as delta goes to zero, and that can depend on the channel. And actually the level here can also depend on the channel, but that's maybe side remarks. Okay. So that shows exactly that the capacity is continuous um, in the parameter delta. So if you put delta to zero, this here goes to zero, and then the, this one approaches actually the capacity. Um, so not only is it positive in non-trivial cases, it also actually is continuous in that parameter for that model. Are there any questions to the statement? Uh, Matthias, can I ask a, a question? So suppose that I wanted to uh, suppose that I wanted to send a single or that I have a bunch of IID copies of an unknown qubit that I want to send from you know Alice to Bob. So yes. na naively, if I only had a single qubit and I tried to um, I tried to encode it in an error correction scheme, as you observed, that you you know you would be limited basically by the fact that uh, but by, by the rate of a single qubit error, basically at the at the the outset of the encoding and at the end of the decoding. But, yes. but, but are, are you saying that if I have a bunch of IID copies, I can sort of, uh, that, that I can actually, or I mean, how do I say? So are you saying that in the setting that I have a bunch of IID copies of an unknown quantum state, you can efficient, you can encode and decode them robustly, um, even if your encoder and decoders have error, or is, is that not what's- yeah, No, it's not. You see the information here is still classically going in. Oh, it's still classical inputs. I'm still I talking see. about classical capacity. Um, we can also talk about the quantum capacity, um, but, but for the moment, think about the classical capacity. I see. Okay? So information okay. comes in in a stable way here, classically, and it ends up in a classical state. Got it, thank so you. So if you want to, because you have to have some, there has to be some stable, um, you could also start with quantum information that is already stably encoded in an error correcting code, as Got units, it. and we talk about it. But yes. Okay, thank you. So it's quantum, uh, sorry, classical inputs. Essentially. It's classical inputs, yes. And they're assumed to be stable. So if you um, went out to introduce here, you know, then it, it's important that they actually assume to be stable too. Got it, thank okay, you. So, yeah. All right, more questions? I have one more, Matthias. So that's not really related to your theorem. If you, if you hear people with more practical practice, they all say at the moment fault tolerance is impossible. So, so can you somehow accommodate that with your theorem, or is do you have an idea what that how that what is meant by that statement? I mean, I heard it very well, at often. The moment, um, yeah. So I, I guess at the moment the um, uh, the qubits are too noisy. Um, at the qubits. Well, at the, at, at the moment, things are too noisy, basically, to be so to be so there, there are two reasons, maybe things are too noisy to be below threshold. Mm -hmm. Okay, but also, um, if you do these encodings here, it blow, I mean, I said before, it doesn't blow up your circuit by much. <laughs> but it doesn't blow it up. If you think about a large circuit, it, 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 it is in practice for small circuits, a large blow up. So okay, it might blow up is too Okay, the threshold is not reached and the blow up is too big. Is that essentially what? No, the, 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 there's a constant in front. Okay, so there is basically a, um, uh, yes. So so you have a blow up uh, simply um, because you do this encoding. Okay, so just mm -hmm. imagine now we're doing three levels. Okay, three levels of um, uh, three levels of uh, uh, of steam code, right? Then it's seven times seven times seven. <laughs> Then uh, every qubit in your original circuit will be replaced by seven times seven times seven qubits. Okay, so this will be a large overhead, right? Um, and the current machines, you know, would say fifty qubits. Um, you know, you cannot encode a single qubit there. Okay. Um, Thank um, but that doesn't mean so. Th that doesn't mean that it will be relevant. Um, uh, yeah. It will be relevant, and I think also this work here should be relevant already in the in the in the current term because um, we have to deal with it. And and of course, like these abstract theorems might not apply, but the techniques 
you, you can also use already in the small cases and think about how to optimize them for small numbers of qubits. So, so this whole art of designing these codes and thresholds and so on is, is an art that, that, that is very relevant for the small cases. Um, yeah, that answered. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll continue. I want to tell you about the proof, okay? So I mentioned before it has two steps. Step one. Um, step one is I want to, uh, I want to basically, uh, I want to take that setup here and I want to um, um, somehow reduce it back to the original noiseless setup. Okay. What happens though is that my channel in the setup will not be the same. It will become slightly correlated across them. It will not be an IID channel. And it, it will also be a little bit more, you know, it will have more bells and whistles added. Okay. So it'll be a little more complicated um, to the so-called effective channel. And then in the sec second stage, we're going to show that the effective channel has a similar capacity as the original one. These are the two states, stages to do it. And then we are basically done, right? Then we have this is the same as this, and the capacity of this is the same as capacity of this. So in this original setting, I have the same capacity as I have in this setting. All right, um, let's do that. Um, all right, so how does this uh, single um, decoder work here? Um, uh, so you should think about it as like the, or one way of thinking about it is that uh, even if it, even though it gets hit by noise, only the last one is relevant, right? And so it's basically behaves like the perfect one plus a little bit of noise. Yeah. Think about it like that. Um, and, and there's actually a paper by um, uh, the group in Gdansk uh, about, about such a statement. And we need some variations on that, on such statements. But, but if we actually have many channels, so many encodings or decodings, just before stuff is being fed into these decoders, they might be hit by an error that's correlated. So when I do this twice, actually, the, the I might still be fine here, but the noise becomes correlated. Okay. Okay. So, so imagine you do this decoder here and the decoder here, and if there's noise here and here, no problem. You just had from before, but now there might be correlated noise that hits these two at the same time, and then you become a you get a correlation here. I'm um, sorry, is that part of your error model? I thought your error models are just like you hit a single qubit with one of three possible non-identity operators. Yes, but you know, it's inside the circuit. So after this error that happens, a C not gate might spread that error to two wires. I see. And, that, and one of the wires might go in here and the other one in here. Okay, so even though the error model is IID, and that's actually why the IID error model is not sort of like a super duper simplification, it still leads to a non IID effect. Um, okay, good. So, and now what we want to do is I want to tell you how to construct this idea. So this this effective channel. Okay, so now I told you roughly that this one you should think of like the ideal channel plus a little bit of noise, but technically we do something interesting. What we're going to do is we're going to try to insert and ideal encoder decoder pairs. Okay, so imagine I have an this is an ideal so I have an encoded qubit and I ideally decode it, and imagine that this here is the syndrome so called the information of where the errors were, and then I encode it again. Okay, so the green one is like a decoding a qubit and encoding a qubit, and this here takes care of which type of errors like the syndrome. Uh, of the error that has happened. And now the such a pair, if in the ideal case, you ideally decode, you encode, that's just the identity. Now we could insert this. So we split them a little bit apart and we insert, it's just the identity operation, I insert it here. So I hope my picture language uh, connection comes in now. Um, and so I insert it everywhere here, right? And on the other side as well, I insert here, here and here. Ah, I forgot I could also insert. Uh, more, but that's important for us now here. Then you see my effective channel will be this part, okay? Um, let's see if I did this, okay. So this one here, because this is the perfect decoder, you can use standard techniques from this fault tolerance, uh, quantum compu uh, computing, and you can morph this into a perfect encoder. 
Then you just have the error syndromes hanging out here. And then on the other side, this here becomes the perfect decoder. And because this was perfect, okay, before it was noisy and then you couldn't make such a statement. And then you, you have the stuff in the middle and this now becomes your, you see, the cool thing is that now it's really a channel from one qubit going back to one qubit, okay? Before with this, yeah, it's a one qubit channel. It goes back to one qubit. And so this is your effective channel. Now you have many of them. That's fine. But as I mentioned, the error syndromes here, the nice thing is they are actually decoupled from the perfect encoder, but they're not, they're correlated across the channels. Okay. So they are correlated. So I, I try to illustrate that here a little bit. So let me zoom out a little bit. Now you should forget the meta structure in a minute. So this one was what I told you before. It's the identity plus a little bit of noise. And this error syndrome really is just being traced out just as it's created there. So this is the effective channel. The effective channel is really just the original channel here where I trace out the syndrome plus and then some noise state, okay, coming out from this here. I'm now pulling it the higher level up, okay? So I have the perfect encoder with the error syndrome. And now I have the, the, the channel and it has some noise, some, some fault tolerance that is being, some syndrome that are being traced out, plus some arbitrary channel here. And the same, I have N copies of that. And then I have the perfect decoder. And now from the perfect encoder, these wires go in here and the error, and, and they go further here. And the error syndromes, they actually correlate the channels. Okay, the error syndromes might actually be quantum states, so it's a little bit weird to think about it all. But the, the nice thing is, is that we somehow, you see, it looks like we got control now of our setup. It looks like we're back to the beginning where we had in like an IID setup, just with a bit of yellow complication. So here's our effective channel. Maybe we don't go into it much. It's called an arbitrary varying channel. Actually, people have studied this already, such a setup. So we use some so-called post-selection technique. And we show that actually this, this uh, error syndrome is not so important. You can get rid of this, but we still have this like arbitrarily varying channel part here. And then we use standard random coding arguments for such a tensor product. And we need explicit bounds, so we had to repeat some stuff that was in the literature, but never mind. And so, and then we actually result at the whole level capacity, what I explained on the board. And this capacity itself is, is, is then actually continuous in this parameter delta. So we evaluate the capacity of this thing here. And it's continuous in the parameter delta, and also when you regularize it, so it's fine. And so we obtain the proof for our theorem. So there is a threshold such that the capacity of the delta noise is actually just the capacity of the one without noise. Okay, um, so this is what I wanted to, uh, to tell you. Of course, the corollaries are that it's positive, uh, you know, in non-trivial cases and that it's continuous as we, we've shown. Um, uh, so I, I think with this, I leave you with a summary. I, I have a few remarks at the end, but um, um, I think this is a new paradigm for for uh, for fault tolerant quantum communication. Um, there have been big books written about quantum communication under the assumption of noiseless encoder and decoder, and I think it's important to ground them and show that they will work with noisy quantum computers. We have defined this capacity. We have established this. We have also done it for the quantum capacity, and um, it's relevant both for quantum communication if we want to actually uh, use that, and. Um, uh, it has like theoretical ramifications, establishes that the standard quantum channel theory is the appropriate model, right? So and somehow we can be very happy because all we have studied with this noiseless encoder decoder thing, it actually is the correct paradigm that we should study. And uh, experimentally, we, we get like explicit constructions now um, that, that hopefully when we make them optimize them smaller, we can use them for small ones where there is noise. And uh, there, there is a broader relevance in quantum computing. And um, and the reason is, 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 is actually an interesting one. I have a, have a picture here. So this here is a picture of five superconducting qubits in a ring that Charlie Marcus group here at NBI uh, made following a proposal for, uh, from us some years back. Now, these superconducting qubits are very large. Like they're actually so large they're visible with the naked eye. And, and that means that when you put them in a the fridge, they're not very many fitting on the chip 
because these resonators here are very large. So if we want to scale up quantum computing, we actually might have to put them in many fridges and connect them with wires. OK, so when you think about this quantum communication paradigm and connecting noisy quantum computers, don't only think about Alice in Europe and Bob in America. You should really also think about this inside the quantum computer and and, and the communication within the computer. Um, and with this note, I, I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks, Arthur, for the invitation. And well, thank um, you very I'm, much, Matthias, for a beautiful talk. So I'm sure now there are many questions, but um, let me just start by asking, is Charlie trying to uh, use your method and implement it in some circuits? Um, uh, there is, um, uh, yes, we're, we are talking to, um, uh, to people from QDEF, which is the uh, Center for um, uh, Quantum Devices here in Copenhagen. Um, uh, that is setting up a new superconducting qubit effort. Um, and we'll see if we can realize some of these ideas here. Well, there is interest and I think could be very exciting. Cool. So, Jordan, you have a question? Yes, so, so I wanted to get back to this. Uh, so as for the last point that you were making, Matthias, about having quantum computers talk to one another in different fridges, well, the context of that that's presumably the most important is the one in which you're transmitting quantum information between the computers, not classical information. Uh, so, but is it, the, is it known whether it's sort of hopeless or not to be able to fault tolerantly encode IID copies of unknown quantum states? For some so of the reasons- ask, Answer it and try to answer in two stages. For the first, um, uh, yes, but if the overall, you see, if the overall goal of your joint computation of your two fridges, say, is to factor primes, or to factor, sorry, to factor, to factor numbers into primes, then of course the input is still classical and the output is still classical. It's just the communication in between, so it falls perfectly into the scenario that we're having. Sure. So um, now if you have a quantum, if you want to really talk about playing quantum information to, to send from, from one to the other, um, uh, then you will have to either, you have to, you, the, the same, I mean, the same statement applies, you cannot protect the naked qubit. So you cannot protect one naked qubit, you cannot protect n uh, un, unprotected qubits. So it, either they come already in an error correcting code, and yes, then we can transmit it, or uh, we can talk about the consequences. So not only for computation, but for instance, for non-local games, you could talk about the consequences. And with help of this, you can also define a quantum capacity, right? You could, for instance, uh, you know, you can define, um, uh, you can define a, a quantum capacity, but the way to define it then is a little bit roundabout by optimizing overall measurements at the encoder and decoder, okay? So um, that would be the, the formal way of defining it. Otherwise, you have to assume you have to start with some stable information and end with some stable information. Thank you. But but I'm not excluding that there are other interesting questions regarding that. that, that, that Thank you. So are there other questions? There are many experts here, but. So I don't know if somebody is trying to talk and they're muted, but uh, if you press the space bar, you can unmute yourself. Oh, 
Well, if not, I'd like to thank you again, Matthias, for a really nice talk. And thanks, Arthur. Thanks for having it, having me. See you again next week. Okay. Bye bye. We go. Bye. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.